I'm so pleased to be there too, uh, Ariel, and thank you very much for inviting me. And, and it's good to meet a lot of you who I know and you know know very dearly. So hello to uh, Vincenza too. Um, and I think I'm going to meet uh, Professor Estefan shortly in a couple of weeks in uh, in Ecuador. Quite looking forward to that. Um, but today I've been asked to speak about the, the screening clinical diagnosis um, of di diabetic sensory neuropathy, but also painful diabetic um, neuropathy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think um, uh, everybody, including you, Ariel, and in particular, Vincenza, your talk was amazing. I mean, as usual, but it was really illuminating. I think you covered my my given topic anyway. So I, I feel like um, I don't have much to do and I could just about go home. So for those of you <laughs> who are hearing most of this talk, go out, have a beer. No one's watching you on the internet. Um, that's one advantage. Or, or tune into Netflix if you don't like a beer. Um, but um, I'm going to come across a bit like a disruptor in this. Um, um, and, and I'm trying to approach this a little bit like a physician who works in a busy clinic rather than a diabetologist with a specific focus in, in diabetic uh, neuropathy. Um, so um, my talk isn't as uh, heavy as as the ones that I've heard from uh, Ariel as well as Vincenza, but I'm I'm trying to sort of give us sort of a more basic overview of how how we do things um, in a more frontline service. Um, you've already heard about diabetic neuropathy being very common, pain being um, quite significantly common, and I think I've seen data now coming from Rayas Malik uh, from Qatar showing even higher prevalence of painful diabetic uh, neuropathy where people. Um, in Qatar have uh, an abnormal NDS, a neuropathy disability score of about 25% of them, I think, or 30% had an abnormal neuropathy disability score, but nearly 42% in that cohort had an abnormal DN4 um, assessment. So huge discordance, but yet a significant prevalence of um, neuropathic pain. Um, and in this, I'm just going to briefly outline the spectrum of diabetic neuropathy as, as to how I see it um, and how we, we position our, our testing here in, in, in London in particular, not necessarily the United Kingdom, um, and go into the differential diagnosis uh, of uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy as well as painful diabetic neuropathy. And I won't cover too much on this. It's a multimodal, multifactorial insult to the neuron, um, um, both metabolically, but also from a microvascular perspective. And often it's unclear which comes first, which comes second, um, but it's fairly understood that they sort of work synergistically to try and, and damage the neuron. And that the neuronal damage, um, although is peripherally evident, happens in different regions pretty much at the same time, including the cardiac muscles. Um, and the risk factors for developing diabetic uh, sensory peripheral neuropathy are very similar to traditional cardiovascular risk factors. I mean, um, the data both from the DCCT and from Solomon test phase Eurodiab studies all highlight the impact and the close relationship with um, vascular risk factors. Um, and there are some comorbidities that we see with them, uh, depression, cardiovascular disease, retinopathy. I've often wondered whether, you know, especially in type 1 disease, type 1 diabetes, if some of our, the, the depression is actually a, a type of autonomic neuropathy. We're doing some work looking into that at the moment. But as people get older, um, there's an element of cognitive dysfunction that is creeping in and is cognitive dysfunction well, it's not a peripheral neuropathy, but it's, it's, is, is it some sort of uh, analogous neuropathy occurring? These are all sort of various interesting hypotheses. Won't go much into uh, small fiber and large fibers uh, because it's already been covered by the various speakers. Um, and the focus is really on this talk on the, the, the distal sensory peripheral neuropathy, both the painless and the painful ones. Um, to some, some extent, we should be lucky given the high prevalence of neuropathy within diabetes that it's a sensory predominant one. Um, imagine the global challenge would be if it was really a motor 
predominant disease. Um, and, 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 but the motor sim, um, prevalence, you know, the symptoms and signs are not inconsequential. Ultimately, my work where I sit is all due to that element of diabetic neuropathy, the lack of sensation complicated by often foot deformities brought on by the motor neuropathy. Um, and I was astounded to hear, uh, but actually it's very true what Vincenza said, um, that uh, looking for diabetic neuropathy is low priority in many countries. Um, absolutely, I think it's true. It's the same in every country that you go to. Uh, but people often forget that the same country spent billions of pounds on, or dollars looking after the complications of peripheral neuropathy. Yet um, the, the focus isn't on screening. Now, maybe that's because 50% of our patients are asymptomatic um, at start. And so it sort of creeps up on you. Um, but um, we, in 2023, are still very, very hesitant to have a program where we characterize neuropathy very in detail. So I'm really pleased that Ariel has a whole day of session of talks just to focus um, and, and think about both sensory and autonomic neuropathy. Now, this is what I usually see in my clinic, you know, patients and the sequelae of, of diabetes. And you can see this beautiful um, picture of my patients with type 1 diabetes, um, who's now developed quite a lot of wasting in both his muscles. You can see the quadriceps wasting, the, the, the small muscles in the legs being wasted. They've gone on to develop a charcoal. And what you can't see is because of this rather obtuse shape of the foot, they've also got a pressure ulcer inside that. Um, so this is the downstream sequelae of, of diabetic neuropathy. Um, this is quite an advanced stage, and, and at this stage, really, we can't do much. Um, but it's important, I think, um, that we focus uh, our energies on seeing if we can get this identified early. And it's not just the, the feet, isn't it? It's the hands, too, that can be affected by the neuropathic process. And, and, and yes, the guidance, it's, it's, it was really... Um, very interesting to listen to uh, Professor Spalloni earlier talking about the guidance, the impact of guidance, whether they are just an expensive toy um, or they truly uh, indicate you of a clinical direction we need to sort of undertake for the future. Um, but, you know, compared to, say, when I started out as a research fellow, we are very lucky now that we got some new guidance is out to at least get the field moving forward, getting people not just interested in neuropathy, but generally diabetologists, uh, general physicians, um, even cardiologists to start thinking um, about how things are going. I mean, we've had a, a nice guidance statement, but it was aimed at the diabetic foot. It wasn't aimed at looking for diabetic neuropathy. Um, but I'm really pleased that the, there's an ADA consensus and there is the international expert consensus that was launched at Neurodiab a couple of years ago. It's really very nice to have these two documents side by side um, for us to understand the breadth of neuropathy, but also the challenges in, in, in diagnosis, because these two documents are fairly um, widely different. Um, in terms of how they position the same problem. That's how I interpret um, how they look at it. I mean, um, I haven't compared them in this talk. That's what not I was planning to do. Um, but it, if I have to go into looking for assessments of neuropathy, um, starting early is good. And the ADA consensus is that we start looking for features of neuropathy very early at diagnosis. Um, and in type 2 diabetes within five years or just five years around that, and then annually thereafter. And that the assessment should include history and, uh, and uh, assessments, um, which may have a large fiber and a small fiber component, uh, and that all patients uh, should have a monofilament testing uh, for risk of ulceration and amputation. And I find this both very clear 
and very confusing at the same time. Um, and, and, and that's partly, um, uh, I think, addressed by Professor Spalloni when she talked about how we do we use these consensus documents? Um, what, what do we do with them? And you can see down over here um, in the in the red in the in the red well, so rect rectangle, it really talks about what the ADA wants us to do. They want us to look at the monofilament test, do the vibration pressures and pinpricks, uh, both at the initial visit and annually. And I can see if they're all normal, you can do them annually. But in someone with established complications, already had a foot ulcer already you know that the 10 gram monofilament is abnormal do you really want to do all of this again and again are you just duplicating lots of questions that come out from these guidelines and how would i approach this sort of the the, the nerve damage is monotonic if you have advanced neuropathy um perhaps um you, you know you don't look into this again and again um and and and, and our clinics in london in the southeast london where i work are very much shaped to, to address it um, in, in this way. We, we, we go for the big problem, which is the loss of protective sensation. That's our big deal. That's where our patients run into trouble. That's when they can get ulcers. So we look at loss of protective sensation. Um, but if, of course, when we do that, there's a whole lot of neuropathy before that, that can go missed. Um, at the moment, um, it is very tricky to to look for it unless our patients want us to to look but we we hinge our bets over here and and for that we use the 10 gram monofilament um and if the 10 gram filament um in its various guises is is normal then of course they have annually a 10 gram monofilament assessment um and you're quite right in this group might be worthwhile um, of course, doing the, the vibration perception, um, doing the sen uh, sensation um, tests, getting their symptom scores done. We don't do that at the moment. Um, uh, it is something that we are very keen to do for the future. Um, of course, there are other methods to assess loss of protective sensation. We use the vibrant tip or more commonly um, in many parts of our service, we use something called a neurosthesiometer. This is something we use uh, on every patient. So they have a monofilament test and a neurosthesiometer, a bit of duplication, but we do like the, the, the quantification that comes with the neurosthesiometer, uh, very useful. Now the data suggests if you have a vibration perception more than 25, that could be indicative of loss of protective sensation. But, but clearly for a younger person, uh, they can have neuropathy between that. So this is a huge challenge for us when we have a dichotomous variable, yes and no, um, um, because the initial assessments, for example, the role of the neurosthesiometer was set up um, as, as a cutoff to look for risk of ulceration. World over, that is still used as the measure of neuropathy, but it isn't. Um, and if, if you look more detailed in the, the screening document, um, the consensus document for 2022 is very clear. There is a relationship between most neuropathic indices and age, and it's a it's an inverse relationship. And while this is for the Riddell's uh, tuning folk, um, we often use cutoffs around 15 um, in individuals under the age of 60 to identify them as having diabetic. Um, neuropathy, and that's how we have worked our system. So anything over 25, loss of protective sensation, anything over 15, still abnormal and possibly indicating neuropathy. And so they're considered sort of moderate risk for future ulceration for the future. Um, many years ago, when I was doing my research with Jerry Raymond, we did the um, touch the toes test, which is essentially a very crude way of assessing uh, for uh, neuropathy, but actually a very, very crude way of assessing um, for uh, loss of protective sensation. Um, this was done because in hospitals, you can't find a monofilament at, uh, at any time of the day, literally. You know, you go to the ED and getting hold of a monofilament isn't high on the agenda. Um, and so we came up with this test so that we could pick up those coming into hospital um, who need protection to ensure they don't get pressure damage or pick up a problem while in hospital. 
Now, lots of work has been done on this, both in hospital settings, but very much in primary care, low resource settings like India, um, uh, rural Saudi Arabia, um, and, and I think a little more, little amount of data now coming out from Latin America showing that this test may have some value. It's got um, a copper value of between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 when compared to the 10 gram monofilament. So not perfect, but, but better than no test. Doesn't need any equipment. So really, um, we, we, we focus on those key, key um, elements. I, I won't go much into composite scores, but really these are quite useful if you're going, doing research because they're a lovely way of capturing and documenting what's going on. Almost all our research studies would use one of the uh, these ones, well, most for pain studies, usually have the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Questionnaire, which I think is a great one, and also the DN4. These are the two ones. But clinically, we often use the Neuropathy Disability Score um, because it's much more um, practical and easy to do. Um, and this is where our challenge is. There are so many tools to assess the same two uh, nerve fibers. Um, and everybody who publishes on each of these fields feels that they have the right tool um, um, that is going to dissect the earliest neuropathy um, and, and the earliest. The question is, which of these tools should me or I as a clinician in a frontline clinic who has got 10 minutes to see these patients um, use? Um, which of these tools, if I was going to develop a national screening program for neuropathy assessments in the future, should I be using uh, where I can get people to come in, have their tests done and go back? Now, these are big questions and the answer isn't that I'm not planning to give you one either, but I, I have often wondered um, which one would we really want to use or which one can be practically used. But so our, our way of approaching this is, if I'm seeing someone in clinic, and my question to myself is, am I going to see this gentleman to assess for the risk of foot ulceration? All I do is look for a loss of protective sensation, and that's how we play with this. And for that, we could use the monofilament or the vibration perception threshold or the tuning fork. Um, we could use uh, NDS as an option because the NDS more than six is considered equivalent to a VPT. But if, if, if I'm really wanting to categorize whether this individual with mild symptoms or even significant symptoms um, has true neuro, you know, di early diabetic neuropathy, um, that I should start thinking of cardiovascular risk modification, looking for other things, then I think then it's quite tricky. But I still would go and look for loss of protective sensation as the first step, because if that's abnormal, then I, I kind of have my answer. But of course, if it is normal and they can still feel it, or that is when we would dig deeper and that's when we would start using the ADA consensus of doing two tests. Um, and I think during the, the last three or four talks, we've had significant amount of debate of which of these tests should be used, which of these tests are more difficult to use. Um, and reality is we need clear guidance and consensus on where things should sit. Um, and it's not only that, um, should we be repeating this test every year if one of the loss of protective sensation tests are already abnormal? It's, that's, that's the key thing. But however, if I have someone with atypical symptoms, we have a large eating disorder service over here, lots of type one diabetic individuals, with poorly controlled diabetes who improve their control quite significantly, but quite quickly, they can present sometimes with quite severe pain. Um, most of the time it's treatment induced neuropathy of diabetes, but sometimes you get people uh, referred to as severe pain, weight loss. Um, um, they could be young, they could be older. And this sort of presentation is not typical of the, the more gradual presentation of DSP. And so for these ones, uh, doing simple tests, a monofilament is not going to be useful. I think the way we need to do is we need to look broadly um, and, and do a detailed neurological examination. This is where 
I think no conduction studies are very useful, not to confirm diabetic neuropathy, but to look at alternatives. Um, autonomic studies are also very useful. Um, and we do a joint clinic with our neurology colleagues to help delineate these issues. Um, and, and, on, and although the, um, the ADA test recommends, um, uh, actually, I mean, I got it wrong. What the ADA uh, consensus documents does not recommend neurophysiological testing uh, or a neurology referral. I think that's a strong statement. It's a great statement. Um, but it, it, in that very long, long sentence, it, I think, kind of buries that, the, the atypical, the, when the diagnosis is unclear. Those are the two very important elements that really need inquiry. And this is when we see them jointly with the neurologist as quickly as possible, and then do a battery of tests, not just one, to find out what's going on. This is how we clinically approach our, our diabetic foot patients. Um, the diabetic foot risk ulcer assessment is not just about looking for neuropathy. Diabetic neuropathy is the most important gear within which we look for the, the foot ulcer risk. But the foot ulcer risk is a composite of neuropathy, foot deformities, which are a type of neuropathy, arterial disease, and a host of external precipitants. Um, and that's what drives it. So just having loss of protective sensation does not mean neuropathy. Um, sorry, does not mean foot ulcer risk. Um, and the key components that we use are looking for the, the, the pulses, looking for advanced sensory loss, and looking at foot shape. And when we put these together, look, we can then come up with an algorithm of classifying them as low, moderate, or high risk. The other important thing is that there is an active list that we use in the UK. That's for all people with open wounds and ulcers or diabetic foot problems. When they heal, they don't go down to low risk. They go down and remain in high risk. So it's important to remember this is until you ulcerate uh, only. And once you ulcerate, but you go on to heal, you stay as high risk. Um, and repeating these tests, um, and all this is not going to be very helpful at this stage, um, and it's all about monitoring these individuals. So differential diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy and pain. Um, I, I looked this up while preparing for this, and essentially everything out there is uh, able to mimic diabetic neuropathy. Um, and, 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 and the differential is so wide. Um, I, I'm surprised that we often get to see these patients within 10, 15 minutes, but in clinic, we look for a few key elements. We look for structural spinal disease. There's a lot of our patients are obese. When they come to us with pain and neuropathic symptoms, they also have back pain. Um, and we like to look to see if there is any spinal entrapment syndrome complicating. We like to know if there's B12 folate deficiency, hypothyroidism. Uh, chronic kidney disease is a big thing. And alcohol probably is, is a big thing. Um, but in our elderly patients, we often look for other elements that could drive neuropathy. This is our standard protocol when patients uh, come to our service. This is done during their first visit. Not everything gets done for everybody. There are a few absolutely vital tests that we do for everybody. Um, and then certain, sorry, certain other screens like the celiac screen and all the hepatitis serology if certain elements are abnormal. Um, we don't do no conduction studies for everybody, but we do the, get referred patients who are quite atypical um, and our use of an MRI lumbar sacral spine um, is about 30% of all patients referred to a service end up having a lumbar sacral spine uh, and a discussion in the spine MDT for completion. This is how we do. We are very lucky for the ones with normal no conduction, normal vibration perception thresholds, um, and normal intraepidermal nerve fiber densities. Um, we have Jody Sarah with us, uh, who is well known to Ariel, um, and we can refer him for microneurography to establish the diagnosis. But in the last 10 years I've been here, I've sent about six people to him. So these are not big numbers. Um, we use these tests very sparingly. I've tried to use um, certain of these um, assessment of severity questionnaires but I found it very difficult to use these questionnaires 
and our patients find it very difficult. So I go with this, and I think uh, most of you will agree on this. Um, the Option DM study also just used the NRS, which is the zero to 10 score. Um, and pain is such a, a subjective sensation. Um, and, and people interpret that uh, the NRS as a useful or a not a useful tool. I really think if it's your pain, you can interpret it the way you want it. So I really like the NRS, um, and I don't know what you all think. Um, and this is, we've gone and we stuck to the NRS. We don't use any of these um, sort of pain questionnaires anymore. Just go to the NRS and take it from there. So on that note, um, I would want to summarize this as the, 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 the differential for diabetic neuropathy is wide, but often it, diabetic neuropathy is very clearly evident by the time they come to us. The, the investigations we do are to rule out, then rule in any other secondary causes. Um, the huge variation in working characteristics of most of the tests that we use um, uh, and there's a very um, inconsistent correlation between nerve conduction studies and many of the other less established tests that we have in place. We don't have a fundamental agreement on which would be the ideal screening test for diabetic neuropathy, early diabetic neuropathy. Um, and our focus is mainly on loss of protective sensation at the moment. I have an issue with some of these guidelines which tell you keep on recurrently ticking the boxes on have you had a, your vibration perception test done every year. I think it's not needed for everybody, but it's that's open for debate, especially if you already got quite advanced uh, sensory loss. All the, that you need is these patients are monitored and have regular surveillance so they don't run, don't run into problems. Um, but on that note, um, I'm really grateful for all of you listening to, uh, to me and really, really grateful um, for the invite. And I really look forward to tomorrow evening where I debate my other favorite topic, um, which is uh, the severely infected diabetic birds. And if he had a way of halting neuropathy or identifying early neuropathy, I would be put out of business, I think, and I would like that. So thank you for listening to me. I'm very grateful for the invite.